Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen McCrudden Illett, a Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence. I hope you're all having a great time in Montreal. Before I start, I first want to thank Jean-Paul Gagnon for the invitation to speak to you and for organising this workshop. This has been a long running discussion and I feel privileged to be able to share my thoughts on it with you today. So I want to begin by telling you about a famous cartoon from a 1988 Punch magazine. It shows six people, five men and one woman, sitting around a table in a rather bland office. The man at the head of the table looks pretty excited about something, but strangely enough, the woman seems a little irritated. We soon discover why from the caption. That's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs, the man declares. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. Now, we might think that a lot has changed since 1988. However, when it comes to politics, women still encounter problems. Even when women talk politically, we're not very good at hearing them. Mary Beard recently used this very cartoon to make a similar point. And feminist theorists, including, but by no means limited to, Ellen Zixou, Ray Langton, Bryony Lipton, and Elizabeth McKinley, have reflected for decades on the problems that women encounter in having their speech heard. I want to suggest to you today that this difficulty in hearing women when they speak politically has hampered our understanding of democracy up until now. The history of political thought, my field of expertise, has traditionally been pretty bad at including women's voices. Not only is our understanding of the genealogy of democracy lacking, therefore, but we have also missed out on some original and innovative political thinking. There is, however, going to be an upside to my talk. I want to argue that if we are more flexible about what we regard as political thought, and if we do start to include a greater variety of voices in our story of how democracy developed historically, this will, in turn, make us better able to hear women when they speak politically today. Pluralizing the historical study of democracy will challenge the idea that there is only one male-coded way of producing political thought. This, in turn, will facilitate the inclusion of a much broader range of ideas in today's political sphere. Now, to make this argument, I'm going to focus on one historical political thinker. Now, I'm guessing that the vast majority of you will never have heard of her. She only wrote one treatise, and this was published as an appendix to her translation of the work of another man. The majority of her works were anonymously written journal articles, translations, commentaries, or edited volumes on the writings of others. She never held public office, made a speech, or led an army. She worked most often not as an individual, but in partnership with men. And yet, she was an important political thinker. Through these different mechanisms, she developed and expressed an original theory that founded political society on the ability of humans to sympathize with each other. She was, moreover, acknowledged as a formidable intellectual and political force by her contemporaries. This woman was Sophie de Grouchy. She lived in France at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries and was at the centre of events through the bloody maelstrom of the French, Re French Revolution. Now, funnily enough, she never once mentioned the word democracy. Nevertheless, I want to suggest that understanding some of her ideas can fundamentally change the way that we think about democratic theory. This is because of her intellectual and political partnership with her husband, the Marquis de Condorcet. Now, I just want to stress that Grouchy's intellectual life stretched well beyond the boundaries of her relationship with her husband. 
even if that is all we will have time to address today. I'm currently completing a book on the entire development of her political thinking, from the Ancien Régime to the Napoleonic period, and its importance for the emergence of liberalism. So watch this space and do feel free to get in touch if you're interested in hearing more. Okay, so back to Condorcet. Condorcet was, of course, a mathematician and political theorist who was one of the first advocates for women's right to vote. His ideas are also still used today in what is known as an epistemic defense of democracy. Now, bear with me, because I promise we're going to get back to Grouchy in a moment. But first, we have to pause and explore how Condorcet's theory is traditionally used in debates about democracy. The basic argument is as follows. Condorcet developed what is known as his jury theorem, If each individual voter has a greater than 50% chance of making the right decision, then increasing the number of voters increases the probability that the majority decision is correct. The more voters, the more likely you are to reach a correct decision. Democracy, having many voters deliberate, is therefore a good political system. It is for this reason according to scholars like Nadia Urbanati and Lucien Jaume, that Condorcet insisted upon universal manhood suffrage in his 1793 constitutional plan. Now, as you can tell from this so-called competence criterion, the fact that for his theory to work, voters must have a greater than 50% chance of making the right decision, this argument in favor of democracy seems to be dependent on the ability of voters to use their reason. Indeed, Jean has described Condorcet's theory as a politics of reason, where reason here means the capacity of citizens to judge and critique. And it is here that the Condorcet defense of democracy has proven itself open to attack. In his 2016 book, Against Democracy, for example, Jason Brennan declares that the average voter is ignorant and irrational, and democracy therefore results in incompetent government. He explicitly attacks the Condorcet defence, arguing that if the average voter is in fact less than 50% likely to make the right decision, the theory that democracy will yield good results falls down. Now, this is a very results-oriented description of democracy. Juliette Roussin, among others, has pointed out that there is in fact a tension in Condorcet's account over whether democracy is justified because it is probable that it will lead to the right decision or because the right to vote, especially for women, was a natural right. But let's leave that debate to one side for a moment and stay with the results-oriented argument. Because I want to suggest that Condorcet's argument about democracy has been fundamentally misunderstood. He did think that the people had a crucial role to play in judging and critiquing laws, and that democracy was a mechanism through which this could be accomplished. However, the importance of reason to his theory has been overemphasized. Condorcet did not think that the majority of the population would use their minds to come to correct political decisions, but that they would use their sentiments to do so. Just as much as an epistemic Democrat, Condorcet was therefore a sentimental one. And the reason why Condorcet's thinking on democracy has been misunderstood is because we have failed to take into account the importance of Sophie de Grouchy. The bulk of Condorcet's political thinking from 1790 onward, when he developed many of his ideas on democracy, was the result of collaboration between Grouchy and Condorcet. Due to a dismissal of Grouchy's thought, and an underestimation of Grouchy and Condorcet's intellectual relationship during the French Revolution, the importance of sentiment to Condorcet's mature thinking on democracy 
has not hitherto been recognized. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, Grouchy only wrote one extensive philosophical treatise, The Letters on Sympathy, and it was published as a commentary to Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1798. However, my archival research shows that it was likely originally written earlier in the 1780s. Moreover, she was almost certainly a co-author of Condorcet's 1791 Cinq Mémoires de l'Instruction Publique. It was here that Condorcet developed much of the groundwork for his democratic thinking. Not only did the Cinq Mémoires lay out a practical plan for universal public education, but they also reflected on equality, rights, and the liberty of the individual. Crucially, the memoirs are clear that a central aim of educating the people is so that they can play an active political role, specifically so that they can correct the constitution in line with their understanding of their rights and the rights of others. Yet, Although the memoirs are insistent that the people must play a central role in constructing the constitution, this text is also plagued with doubts about the capacity of the population at large to make use of their reason. A bit like Brennan, they seem to imply that the average voter was actually quite ignorant and doubted that he could reason very well. The memoir argues that those, quote, confined to the first stage of education, might not be able to gain the detailed knowledge of their natural and political rights needed to participate politically. So how to square this circle? It is here that putting Grouchy into the mix entirely changes our reading of the memoir. Grouchy argued in her letters that people might not be able to know their rights but they would certainly be able to feel them. In the letters, she had suggested that a good education would provide individuals with, quote, the sentiment of the imprescriptible rights of men and described a mechanism by which reflection on sympathy led to an understanding of rights. And if we return to the memoir with this in mind, we can see that she in fact elaborated precisely the same argument there. The memoir equally uses the language of sentir, to feel, rather than savoir, to know, when discussing rights. Those who are destined for menial labour and would only be in school from the ages of 9 to 13 would be taught to, quote, recognise their rights and their duties in order to be able to exercise the one and fulfill the other without having recourse to the reason of another. Yet the programme of these four years focused on the awakening of natural emotions, not the fostering of reason. The most important of these emotions was pity or sympathy. It was only in the fourth year when pity had been nourished in the students for three years that the students would be introduced to simple ideas about rights. Considering Grouchy's contribution, therefore, allows us to reconsider the basis for Condorcet's defense of democracy. As Urbanati and others have argued, he saw the people as a sovereign engaged in a work of constant surveillance and critique. But the ability to make this critique was based not only on the reason of the people, but also, or even more so, on their capacity to use their sympathy to access the truth of natural rights and use it as a measure against which to judge the laws proposed. Okay, so unless we are deeply invested in the political thought of the French Revolution, which I'm guessing most of you are not, why should we care? Well, I think that reinserting Grouchy's ideas into discussions of democracy have a clear payoff. They provide a counterpoint for those, like Brennan, who seek to to dismiss democracy as a useful political system 
on the basis that it is founded on a flawed faith in human rationality. Although I'm far from advocating a wholehearted adoption of Grouchy's ideas, her thought provides an alternative and potentially fruitful theory. One in which the contribution of individuals in a democratic system is not purely measurable by their ability to reason, but also their ability to feel. Yet, there are also broader stakes to reconstructing Grouchy's ideas on democracy. Grouchy lived during a period in which women were generally seen as simply not able to participate in the same political speech as men. As one deputy to the French National Convention put it, man alone seems fit for deep and serious meditations, which require great strength of mind and prolonged studies that no woman can pursue. Like it or not, such ideas still flavour our own political imaginary. The canon of democracy studies is peopled with a cast of influential political thinkers which stretches back thousands of years, from Aristotle to Rawls. This cast helps shape our idea of what authority looks and sounds like, what we are trained to understand as authoritative ideas on the subject of democracy, and who is capable of producing that thought. These characters are overwhelmingly male. But there is a way out, and it is here that I would like to end. As I have stressed, Grouchy does not conform to the framework of a traditional democratic thinker. She worked anonymously in collaboration with her husband. She never explicitly said that she was writing about democracy. And yet, as I hope I have shown today, she nevertheless had important ideas that can contribute to our own understanding of the concept of democracy. If we pluralize the study of democracy and recognize the significance of the thought of figures like Grouchy, we will also open the door to a diversification of who can be seen as legitimately contributing to democratic discourse today. Perhaps Miss Triggs will finally be heard. Thank you very much for your time.